All right, it's 1.30. We're going to give it a second. Let folks get lined out. Uh, Carter's going to be preaching for us. All right, there's our first captive audience. There's three. Can I get five? What do we do? What do we do? We did four. We got four, four to four. We did five. What do we get? Five. Looking for five. Looking for five. What do we get? Five. We got four, four, four and a half. Looking for five. Five, five now. Four, four now. Five. Four to five. Four, four to five. Five, five now. Four. Four to four. Four to four. Right now. Now two, three, four. Four to four. Four now. Five. Could we get five? Four to four. No. All right. Well, <laughs> we're going to get started anyway. Miss Barb's going to sing a few songs for us. And, uh, We'll get started. There's five. There's six. We got six now. Looking for seven. Seven now. Looking for six. 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 And hey, six. 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 Looking for seven. Seven. Would have seven. All right. Miss Barb is gonna sing. And thank you for joining us. God walks the dark hills, the highways and highways. He walks on the big. Oh 
situated here and move this back around. Here we go. We're still backwards. We didn't figure out what's going on with Facebook this morning. But, uh, all right. Should be good. Yeah, if you know much about um, that, if you can message me. I don't know what, what's happened, but there's a... Uh, You'll notice the preach the word behind me is uh, backwards on the video and usually there's a toolbar down there at the bottom that you can hit and you flip the screen. Well, when you flip the screen now, and I thought it was the iPad, but I did it on the phone as well. When you flip the screen, it's turning the whole screen green, a uh, green tint like a filter. So I, I, I know that there's not a filter on the iPad uh, because I tried, tried it on my phone and it did the same thing. So I don't know if everyone's having the same problem or what exactly 
is going on. Look at Matthew chapter 28, and thank you for being back with us. Uh, forgot to turn the light on this morning, but uh, we'll leave the light on for you. It's on now, and so that's a blessing. Thank you, Miss Barb, for singing for us, and that's a blessing as well. Uh, I'll reiterate what I said this morning. Next Sunday, we'll um, try to have uh, as many as can or will uh, be ready to come back. Um, our governor has stated uh, beforehand that there was no mandates against churches. They did have some recommendations uh, for churches, and their recommendations is uh, for churches to start back uh, tomorrow uh, with the phase uh, two is the recommendation, I think. Uh, anyhow, May 4th uh, is when he recommended uh, churches are good to go, um, but there was, no, there was no mandate that we couldn't meet uh, prior to that, we checked also with the local health department, and even though there's two people per 1,000 square foot uh, for Marion County, that does not apply uh, to churches, and uh, so there's no mandate. But we want to take all the precautions we can, so we've taken a lot of chairs out, spaced the auditorium out. We'd ask you to come, sit with your family on a row. You can walk in. Um, I'll have the doors propped open that are coming in. I just need to prop the front door open as well. And that way you can come in, don't have to touch a thing. You can sit down in your chair. You don't need to shake hands with anyone. You don't have to, uh, there's not a bulletin to pick up. There's nothing of that nature, nothing that you have to touch. Just sit down. You can wear a mask, grab a mask. Uh, you can wear gloves. I said this morning, you can wear uh, a bee suit. It's not gonna bother me. Uh, and whatever makes you feel safest but I promise you if you'll follow those guidelines and then the spacing that we already have allowed and and cleaning and such and hand sanitizer and wipes and and all of that then uh, now I will tell you the hand sanitizer um, if you were to put it on your hands and get pulled over before you got to the end of Hampton Road there's a pretty good chance that you <laughs> fell in a uh, uh, you know DUI test or whatever it's called uh, sobriety test because that stuff is stout. Uh, I'm guessing the local uh, whiskey mill must have made hands started making the hand sanitizer and it's pretty strong and needs some uh, essential oil to add some uh, flavor to it uh, smell wise. But anyhow, we have all that taken care of, so I hope you can uh, come and join us. If you'll follow those guidelines, I think you'll be safer uh, here uh, than you will be going to Walmart and. Uh, rummaging through stuff that tons and tons of hands have touched and and uh, you can't you can't put something in your basket without touching it right. and you can't you can't go through a drive-through without touching stuff that a bunch of people have already touched and so it's just a matter of what you what you choose to do what you want to do and I hope that you'll be back with us sooner or later Matthew chapter 28 look at verse number 16 and we'll look at through 16 through 20. Matthew chapter 28, and verse 16, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks back, we celebrated uh, the gospel message. We celebrated a resurrected Savior. And uh, the gospel message is a wonderful message. I didn't uh, say a lot about uh, being saved, but if you were listening this morning, it was more of a message to God's people and uh, to our uh, country in general. Uh, but the gospel message is that Christ died uh, perfect, sinless, that he lived a perfect, sinless life, and yet he gave his life for his friends. He was crucified on that cross, and he died, and he was buried, buried in a borrowed tomb, and he rose again three days, three nights later, and, uh, and the resurrection. Uh, if any part of that was not true, then the whole gospel would be a, 
uh, would be fake news. However, he really did live a sinless life. He really was crucified. Uh, he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. He laid down his life uh, and he was buried and he was the, the tomb was guarded and yet he rose again. And we said much about that uh, on Easter Sunday as we had our drive-in service and the gospel message, Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave, uh, the death, burial, and the resurrection. Jesus now in this passage of scripture has made an appearance after the resurrection. It was after the resurrection that he was worshipped and he expounded unto them the scriptures, Luke tells us. And uh, then he sums up his message he desires to leave with the church. It's a message of action. Uh, it's always been important to me what someone had to say in their dying uh, words. In fact, I've even read books and studied a little bit about what some atheists have said in their dying words because I'm interested in it. I'm interested in, you know, what they may have seen or felt or believed right on their deathbed, but, but I'm also interested in what uh, dying saints have had to say. Uh, I, I've heard stories of, of folks looking up into, uh, in, into seemingly the heavens, but just with the days of, of a smile and, and angels welcoming them into the presence of the Lord. And I love hearing those stories, but, but it's when someone is, is right there at the end of, of, of their uh, being seen by someone else that they give a message that is worth uh, listening to. Uh, somebody, if, if they were uh, in your family member, perhaps a, a mom or a dad or a grandma or a grandpa, and they didn't have but a couple of hours to be with you before they would be gone, you would really listen to what they had to say. Well, Jesus begins to sum up as he is going to leave them. Uh, he begins to, and not uh, obviously uh, all together, you understand what I mean, but uh, he sums up a message that he desires to leave with them. It's a message of action. It's a message for all of his followers. And it's what we call the Great Commission. It's a message, the gospel message, that changes lives. It's a message that has changed us if you're a ch saved child of God today. It's a message that builds homes and brings them back together again. It's a message that the world needs to hear. Amen. But it, however, it's a message that is attacked. It's a message that is quieted. It's a message that is oftentimes ignored. Oh, but it's a message that is very much needed. Probably one of the saddest verses in all the Bible uh, comes right after uh, one of the most quoted verses in all the Bible. Uh, one of the saddest verses comes right after one of the greatest, uh, uh, most powerful verses in the Bible, and that's Romans 10, 13, where the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, the next verse says, uh, But how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear and how shall they believe in them and him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? You see, um, the world needs the gospel, but how are they going to hear the gospel? Not just by this preacher, but by those who have received and accepted Christ as Savior. If the world is going to hear that message, uh, it's going to come from uh, the people within the church outside of the church. Uh, see, this message is not just for uh, these walls. It's not just for this building. And it's not just for the lips of this uh, preacher. This is a message that each and every one of us ought to carry with us outside the walls of Hampton Road Baptist Church and fulfill the Great Commission. It's a message that God wants to use you to deliver. It's a message that unfortunately seldom makes its way outside of the doors of the church or outside of the church walls. It's a message that is refreshing. It's a message that has changed our life. It's a message that is rewarding, yet it's a message that has been stifled uh, today. What is it uh, that has caused the gospel message not to go forth? Why is it that we fail uh, to take this message beyond these church walls? I said before that today we, we live in a day of, 
uh, technology and I'm uh, trying to be in the process of uh, ordering up some uh, every door direct mail and and then we've done some Facebook ads and boosted posts and all of that sort of thing. And then many uh, people, you have your social media, your Instagram and your Facebook and your uh, Twitter or uh, whatever it is. We have more avenues to get the gospel out. But really, we fail to use those avenues in an effective way. I, I was preaching one time at a, a church nearby. I believe it was. Uh, I know I was in a building one time preaching a message about uh, Facebook, and I believe I've even said it here. Uh, and what I did was I asked uh, the people in a, a congregation full of people, I said, let me ask you a question. People talk about, you know, I use uh, Facebook for uh, ministry and for the gospel's sake, and, and I think it should be, and I think it could be. And uh, there's definitely people that use social media for good uh, for good reasons and for good quality information and, and all of those things. But I said, uh, since it's such a powerful tool, I was just wondering what the testimony would be in this auditorium. Uh, obviously not today. There's very few people here. But in an auditorium packed full of people, it wouldn't matter if you had 1,000 or 5,000. If we were to have a show of hands and we said, how many of you are sitting in church today and you got saved because of uh, Facebook? Somebody posted a message on there. Somebody gave you the gospel and won you to the Lord off of Facebook. Uh, how many of you would say, I'm here today because of social media? And, and I doubt there would be a hand raised. Very seldom. There might be a few. Uh, but if we were to say, uh, well, let me ask you this question. How many of you are, are here today? How many of you are listening? How many of you are around? And you would say that you have personally had Facebook and you personally used it uh, to advance the gospel in a way that you personally saw someone saved as a result of the message or the typing or uh, the message that you sent out or a post that you made and they contacted you and they said, hey, I'd like to be saved and you were to lead them to the Lord and it was a direct result as the, from the tool of Facebook. You see, uh, it doesn't happen very often. But I wonder why not. I wonder why we have these great tools but yet these tools, we're not using them very effectively. I said before I want to do a, uh, I started a while ago, a, um, uh, that I want to do an every door direct mail. You know, if we can't get out and knock on doors, then, hey, we can send somebody a, a postcard. Uh, and that, that gets costly, but uh, if, if we can't go door to door, and right now if that would be considered insensitive or, uh, you know, wrong, and if it would uh, make everybody upset and that kind of thing for right now, and I understand that with what we're dealing with, but we can send people things in the mail. We can boost posts on social media and try to get the word out. But why is it that we have lacked uh, effectiveness in this matter of spreading the Great Commission? It's such a wonderful message. We would all agree uh, to that. It's a message that has to be taken beyond these walls, but yet it often stops when we leave the door. I was in one church and... I remember walking out the door, and there's a big sign across the door. And uh, as you walked out of the church building, and it said, you're now entering your mission field. I thought that's pretty good uh, because the mission field is not inside of this church building, but rather when we as Christians come here and we get charged up and we get fired up and we get our passion and our zeal and we walk out here and say, boy, the world needs the gospel message and we enter into the mission field, the outside world, as we bring this message of love and the gospel and Jesus uh, to other people. So why is it? Why is it that we have failed to do so? I think I got about four reasons uh, that the gospel has uh, failed to make it. And many of us have been ineffective in spreading the good news and in fulfilling the Great Commission. I think, number one, many do not because of bad doctrine. There are many people that fail to spread the gospel because they don't even know what they believe. Many do not know what the gospel even is. It's the gospel plus nothing. To add to the gospel is to preach another gospel. Jesus paid it all. It's not by works of righteousness 
which we have done, but about according to his own mercy hath he saved us. What is mercy? Mercy is, is uh, when our work deserves hell, it deserves that punishment, it deserves judgment, but yet uh, the Lord Jesus Christ paid our penalty and he gives us mercy. We do not get what we deserve and we deserve uh, hell, but we get heaven. That's grace, us getting something that we do not deserve. Not only did God withhold uh, mercy in our life, but God gives us grace uh, as well. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should bless. So what's grace? It's grace is getting what we don't deserve. I think bad doctrine. Uh, there's some people that believe that we could somehow partly attain salvation and that uh, it's part of us and it's part of the Lord. No, it's 100% the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing that we could do. There's no sacrifice that we could make, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once uh, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. There's no sacrifice that could be made other than the sacrifice that was made by the Lord Jesus Christ. So bad doctrine. Uh, many people are not spreading the good news because they fail to even know what the good news is. I would simply say to you um, that are with us today that we ought to know what we believe, uh, especially something that is as important as eternity. Uh, and if you can't give me the gospel, uh, how are you confident that you have accepted the gospel message? If you can't tell somebody what Jesus did for you and what you believed in, then how in the world can you be saved yourself? Uh, so I think oftentimes it's bad doctrine. All of our righteousness are as filthy rags. Our good deeds are nothing. Bad doctrine keeps us from giving the gospel message. What about baptism? Many believe baptism is essential for salvation, but yet baptism is not. You know, this is, this is the perfect time to point that out. Stick with me for just a second, because the Church of Christ teaches that you've got to get baptized in order to get saved. So, look at our current condition. If that be the case, COVID-19 just kept everybody in hell. Right. Right. If, if you got to get baptized in order to go to heaven, I haven't seen any Church of Christ baptisms going on. I haven't seen churches baptizing. See, see, to believe baptism is essential for salvation is to put the gospel into the hands of someone else besides the Lord. Right. Because I could decide whether I was going to baptize you or not. And I might not like you. I might just say, no, I'm not going to baptize you. Well, guess what? That would, put, that would put the power of sending you to hell in my hands. And no man has that power to save the Lord. Uh, and, and so baptism doesn't get you to heaven. I just thought of that and I thought, you know, I wonder what these churches are doing. I wonder what the Catholic church is doing when you can't meet. And yet they think you've got to be sprinkled to go to heaven or you've got to be uh, uh, sprinkled or poured on as a baby. I guess babies aren't getting baptized, so they must all be going to be doomed for hell uh, just because of COVID-19. I promise you, a pandemic can't keep somebody from getting to the Lord Jesus Christ because it's through him, not a baptismal pool, uh, not our good works. Uh, and, and so anything that man could shut down or man could stop couldn't possibly be the true gospel right. because the Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the Lord's church. So what about baptism? Baptism is not essential for salvation. But many people are not spreading the gospel because of bad doctrine. Baptism comes after conversion, Acts 8, 36 through 39. It happens after conversion. They went down into the water. When Jesus was baptized, he went into uh, the water, and they went down in the water. Bad doctrine says baptism is essential to salvation. Uh, the Church of Christ heresy in Mark 16, 16. Let me look at it with you, uh, just so if you were to argue with the Church of Christ, they're going to say, well, baptism, you've got to be saved and baptized. Well, what are you doing about that? I mean, the church is not even meeting. You're not baptizing anybody. So is the preacher keeping everybody from going to heaven right now? 
I mean, come on, Church of Christ, y'all might have to help me here. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. There it is. That's the go-to verse. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, I could say he that believeth and, and gives offering shall be saved. Well, that'd be true. Uh, he that believeth and drives a Ford truck shall be saved. That'd be true. He that believeth and, and has a Tahoe shall be saved. That'd be true. He that believeth and wears a suit shall be saved. That'd be true. He that believeth and, and uh, wears uh, rags on his head shall be saved. That'd be true. He that believeth and has a pair of tennis shoes shall be saved. That'd be true. Because the rest of the verse explains what the important thing is. But he that believeth not shall be damned. See, it didn't have anything to do with driving a Ford. It didn't have anything to do with the shoes you wear or the clothes you got on your back. It has nothing to do with the baptism. It has everything to do with the belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so, uh, and, and I know what I know what the answer for the, the Church of Christ would say right now. They're going to say, because I confronted one one time about, what about the thief on the cross, you know? And they're used to arguing that. And their point to argue is, well, that was a special occasion and, and God can do whatever he wants to do because he's, you know, Jesus is God and all of that uh, kind of nonsense. No, he sets uh, would set a bad precedent if that was the case uh, of wondering for the rest of eternity. And that's what they're going to say about this right now. Well, we can't baptize so God understands and he's just going to let everybody in because the church couldn't open to even administer baptism. See, that's foolish. Yeah. Bad doctrine keeps people from spreading the gospel. Know what you believe. Amen. Oh, what about uh, Nicodemus uh, in John? Look at look with me, if you would, in John chapter number 3. Look at John chapter number 3. Still on this subject of baptism. In John chapter number 3, and verse number 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of, heaven, of God. Verse number 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily I say unto thee. Watch what's happening here. Jesus says, You must be born again. Uh, you got to be saved, regenerated, a uh, new man. You got to be born again. Uh, and Nicodemus, well, wait a second. How can you be born again? I'm already born. You can't be. Do you enter back in your mother's womb and come back out again? Jesus answered, Verily, verily I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The context is a mother's womb. Being born again first is a physical birth by water. Uh, you, if you've ever been in the delivery room, you know good and well uh, that when that delivery begins to take place, there is a uh, breaking of water. There is a, uh, my water just broke. You know, that's always, uh, I, I remember being sick and actually was about to uh, get ready. To, to, we were supposed to go the next morning or uh, the next day and she was going to have a baby and her water had not broke yet. And, and I went to bed and I was sick and I took some NyQuil and, and uh, I had a cold and I went to bed and laid in bed. And, and I don't know about you, but that stuff just knocked me out about cold. And I was sleeping so sound. And, and she, uh, she woke me up and she said, hey, we got to go to the hospital. My water just broke. And I said, well, do you think we could wait till the morning? No. Now, I just have one eye open, one eye closed. But we couldn't wait. Well, that, that's the context of this, of water. You're born of water, a physical birth. And then the second birth is a spiritual birth, and that's born of the Spirit. Uh, water, uh, no water baptism is needed for heaven. John 3, 36 uh, uh, sums this up. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on 
him. Bad doctrine has hindered us from being personal witnesses. So what do you believe? What do you believe? Well, we have a great commission. We have to know what that is if we're going to deliver that message. We have to understand what the message is if we're ever going to attempt to display it to someone else. Salvation's by grace. Baptism's for believers only. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Forever saved. Uh, God uh, that created the universe is big enough uh, to hold you in the hollow of his hand and uh, you're saved for all eternity. You look up the words eternal, forever, everlasting. It means for good, once saved, always saved. You say, well, what if you do this? You know, people always want to ask goofy questions. Oh, what if you got saved and then, you know, uh, you became this or that? Well, first off, uh, everybody's capable of backsliding. It's always funny to me, the category of sins, there's always these lines that people make from uh, bad doctrine. They make these lines. Well, you can't commit this sin and, and, and go to heaven. You can't commit this sin. And it always just so happens to be the sins that they don't commit, but they never see their sin really and truly as sin. And in order to be saved, you've got to see your sin as what it is, and you have fallen short of God's wonderful and magnificent uh, glory. Bad doctrine uh, keeps people uh, from spreading the gospel message. Once saved, always saved. Now, I believe with all my heart that a person is not going to be a, uh, he, you know, when, when God saves a man, he is uh, a new creature. Old things are passed away, but all, all things become new. You can still sin, but I promise you, you won't have as much fun doing it as you once did because you have a heavenly father that is fixing to lay the wood to your backside uh, whenever you do wrong. Chastisement, the Bible calls it. And if you do not receive chastisement, if you can get away with doing wrong and never feel a whoop and never feel bad about it, uh, never have the Holy Ghost of God convict in your heart, then the Bible says this, and it's a strong word, but it's a biblical word, that you're bastards and not sons. Your illegitimate uh, children is what you are. So bad doctrine, bad doctrine keeps people from spreading the gospel message. I encourage you uh, during this time to study. We were talking at lunch and uh, schools are shut down and I guess kids are probably just going to pass this year and, and there's a lot of kids that can't do their school and can't uh, keep up with everything. And boy, I, I, I encourage moms and dads everywhere uh, don't let your kids grow up and be stupid. Right. I mean, the, mom and dad, you got a heavy responsibility here. Uh, don't let your kids get lazy just because they can't go to school. They can still read a book. Uh, you can still order books off of Amazon or uh, somewhere. You get some good books in their uh, hands and you keep them busy. Don't let them sit around playing that Nintendo and watching that tube all day long. There's no excuse for a kid in today's day to grow up and be stupid. Uh, unless they've got some kind of mental handicap, uh, they ought to be reading, they ought to be studying, they ought to be uh, trying to learn something and apply themselves. Uh, don't use this time for that. Uh, but it, it'd be a good time uh, to even for a child to learn what they believe. I know that if they're in a public school, uh, as far as this past year, they didn't have a Bible class. So now it would be a perfect good, uh, perfectly good time for a mom or dad or somebody to set them down and for them to get Bible class every day, uh, not just on Sunday. We can't even have Sunday school right now. Uh, so it'd be a good idea, a good idea to learn what you believe. So bad doctrine, but not only that, in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 17, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I think bad doubt causes people not to spread the gospel. Some doubt it. I ask you the question, do you struggle with doubt that the Lord would really convict a sinner? Because here's the scenario. The scenario is that I believe that there's a God in heaven. Let's take uh, McDonald's drive through and, and you're looking at a guilty individual when it comes to what I'm about to tell you. But I'm glad that the Lord still convicts my heart over it. Um, and I'm not the witness that I should be whatsoever. I preach a message like this because I want to hold myself accountable. 
and uh, put feet to my, uh, fire to my own feet in this regard because I'm nowhere near the witness that I should be or could be or even have been in the past. But here's what actually happens. Somebody in Alabama is praying for their nephew that works at McDonald's. And he just so happens to get just get a job. He's working in the drive through at McDonald's. And he's got a family member down in Alabama that's praying, Oh, God, please save uh, Johnny. He needs the Lord. And, and Lord, I pray that you send a gospel witness by his way. And then all of a sudden, here you are. Uh, the Lord's convicting Johnny. I mean, he just can't escape the prayers. And Johnny feels convicted. And he knows he ought to be in church. He knows he ought to be under the gospel. And he knows... What his family's got is the truth, and he knows they live different, and, and God's been working on his heart, and all of a sudden, here you come through the drive through Me, this is about what it sounds like. Hey, can I take your order? Yeah, I'll take a large sweet tea, a light on the ice. That'll be $1.27. And uh, so uh, that's what I do. Well, I get up to the uh, to pay, and and if I was to do this, I reach into my uh, pocket, and I hand a gospel track, and Say, here's a gospel track from our church. Do you know the Lord as your Savior? This has got the gospel message inside, and it'll show you how to be saved. And, and all of a sudden, that young man says, you know, I've been thinking about this. I've been wondering about this, and, and I've got a, a family member that's been praying for me, and, and uh, this is what I need. I'd like to be saved. Is this what I do? And, and all of a sudden, you're there. And uh, you get to lead them to the Lord. They get to read the track. They get saved later. However it works out, the question is, do you doubt that God can work like that? Because I think that's why we're not the witnesses we should be, because we forget that God has, that the seeds have already been, some have planted, some have watered, God gave the increase. I think we forget sometimes that that there's already people that are under conviction that are out there waiting for us to show them the truth. Uh, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, they're already reading, they're already studying, they're already searching, they're already wondering, and, and the Lord's already convicting them, but because of our doubt, I just doubt the Lord would do that. I just doubt that, that, that this is a person the Lord is convicting. I just doubt, well, we, we have bad doubt keeps us from being great witnesses. Maybe you have doubt that he has the power to save anyone. Maybe you see a case and you say that's the roughest case of a person. Uh, God, There's no way God would change a drug dealer's life. Well, I promise you he has in the past. And if you doubt that, it will keep you from being a witness. Uh, you say, well, uh, that person's got plenty of money and they're worth a lot of money and they're the richest person in town. And you doubt that, that, that they would ever be interested in the gospel message. Well, when you doubt, you doubt the Lord and it causes you uh, to fail to be the witness you should be. You say, well, that one's wearing a suit or that one's wearing rags or that one really ain't listening or that one this. No, quit doubting what God is possibly doing behind the scenes and we ought to be a witness for the Lord. Maybe you doubt that the scriptures are true. Maybe you doubt that God even gave this commission to us. Maybe you doubt that it's your personal responsibility. Maybe you doubt that God blesses it. Whatever it is, many, because of doubt, never witness like they should, and some never spread the gospel. It'd be a sad reality if you could get in your uh, 50s and 60s and 70s and say, I've never given the gospel, never seen anybody say, you say, well, I, I've never really got to lead somebody to the Lord. Well, there ought to be, you ought to have at least been able to plant some seed here and there. I mean, you can't help it if, if uh, some fell on stony ground and some fell on bad ground, but the Bible says we're to just be planting the seed and even on clay, even on rocks. Yeah. Every once in a while, you're driving somewhere and you see a just pile of rocks and there's a plant growing out of it. You think, how in the world did that happen? It don't happen that often, but you sow enough seed. Uh, sooner or later, something's going to come up somewhere. You don't worry about the ground. You don't know what God's been doing to the ground. Uh, you don't know what, what, what's been going on in someone's life. Just sowing the seed and quit doubting that God blesses it. That's right. What is it that keeps you from sharing this good news? Bad doubt. Maybe it's bad doctrine. Maybe it's bad discipline. See, we're commanded to go. We're to obey this commission. Go ye. Go ye, therefore. 
and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Go, teach, but bad discipline. If it's not number one and it's not number two, you can rest assured it's number three. Laziness. Laziness. Too much wasted time on things that don't matter. Temporal things. See, if we're not careful, we'll get in the mood, well, my family's saved. Well, my house is saved. Well, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm not worried about everyone else. I wonder if there's ever even been a time when you would take 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and let your light shine before your friends on social media and give your testimony. I wonder if there's ever been a time when you when you wrote out the day, the greatest, if it's the greatest day of your life, if it was the most life-transforming, life-changing thing that ever took place, wouldn't you want everyone to know that? Amen. And we have the technology for that message. See, you used to, you'd have to call up, you know, or, or really in Bible days, you'd have to run into somebody personally and say, hey, let me share, your, share my testimony. This is what the Lord means to me. Uh, and then we got uh, telephones and, and you had to call somebody. Now you can do mass text. You know, you can send it out and uh, you can write your testimony and say, hey, I just want all my contacts to know uh, here's the day the Lord's saying it's wonderful. What, whatever your testimony is and you send it out. But even now, uh, we don't even have to call. We don't have to run into them. We don't have, all we can do is sit right there on that keyboard, on that computer screen and send it out to 200 or 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 or up to 5,000 people on our Facebook uh, message of our testimony. Now, why is that not being done? Bad doctrine? Bad doubt? You doubt God can use that? Do you doubt that somebody might be reading through there and say, you know what? I, I remember when God changed their life. That's what I need. That's real. I remember. I remember the day when old things were passed. I, I remember the day when they quit going out with the boys. I remember the day when, when her uh, uh, demeanor changed. I remember the day. And boy, uh, that's a sweet lady or that's a, a good godly man and, and they've got a good testimony. Do you doubt God could use your personal testimony? Many times it's because of laziness. We're interested in temporal things. It's because of apathy that we talked about this morning. Who really cares? All my family's saved anyway. It's an it's a, it's a unfaithfulness. It's a lack of compassion. The Bible says in Jude 22, and if some have compassion, making a difference. And then it says pulling them out of the fire. It, it's going to take some folks realizing that there's a real literal hell and our discipline uh, our lack of discipline, our bad discipline is going to keep the gospel from getting to people that are really dying and going to hell. It's bad discipline. It's bad time management. What's most important is it even on a list for you and I uh, to be better witnesses. We've all got kind of a little bit of an excuse right now when it comes to, as I said before, you know, I don't know that door, going door to door is is that wise? Because, uh, you know, people are so upset right now about everything. I think, you know, but not to say that it, we're not going to get back to it, and we might get back to it next month. I don't know. We'll have to let the Lord lead us in that direction. But I'm saying we don't have to be knocking on one particular street, knocking on doors to be a witness. We can be a witness everywhere we go. But bad time management keeps us from it. Rebellious. Bad discipline. It's my life and I'm not doing it. I got something to tell you. It's not your life. Right. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. And God wants to glory with your life in giving this gospel message. Why is it that we fail so bad with the gospel message that we've been entrusted with? Perhaps, there's one last thing. It, maybe it's not bad doctrine. Maybe it's not bad doubt. Maybe it's not even bad discipline, but it just might be that it's bad deception. See, Judas died and went to hell. Judas had the right church. He had the right pastor. 
He had the right baptism, but he never truly believed on Christ. Maybe there are some that have really and truly their need is to be saved before you go spreading the gospel. It's hard to tell somebody how to be something that you're not. Because there's always this idea of, I hope they can't see through me. Here I am going to tell them about trusting the Lord as Savior and I'm not saved myself. You're deceived. I'm not even saved. How are you going to tell somebody about something that you're not? Maybe there's some that need to be saved before spreading the gospel. It's hard to give a testimony when you ain't got one. I remember as a youth pastor being in a motel room in Michigan. And the Lord had kind of laid it on my heart. We were in the room and, and uh, all the teenagers and counselors and the guys, the men, uh, the counselors and the boys, we were all together and combined our rooms and we were having a time of testimony. And I said, uh, uh, fellas, I, I'd like to go around the room and have everybody share their testimony about when you got saved. And, uh, and, and I started it off and then the next person, we just went around the motel room down here on the floor and on this bed and then this chair and uh, over here and Indian style over here and began to go around uh, the motel room there. And uh, I, I remember getting to a young man and he was all choked up and barely he could talk. talk and he said, I, I, no, 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 say. And uh, my brother-in-law, John, took him out of the room and began to take a Bible and show him how to be saved. And, and uh, you know, it's hard to testify about a testimony that you really know nothing about, that you don't have. I wonder if, if we were to do it in this auditorium, I wonder if we were to use those that would watch the video. And if I said, all right, here, I see so-and-so is watching. Oh, why don't you, why don't you uh, uh, go uh, to the screen, cut over to your house, and I want you to give me your testimony. What would you say? Many people can't, they don't have a testimony to give, and they're deceived. And I simply say to you today, you need to get saved while the Lord is still speaking to your heart before it's eternally too late. Amen. Because many will say in that day, Lord, 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 Lord. And many are going to say, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name done many wondrous works? And he, he'll say, depart from me, I, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. So we're failing in the Great Commission. Our Lord left us with this business, the most important business. I venture to say I, I did this when we were, uh, when I first became uh, pastor. I remember Brother uh, Scott Hall was in the auditorium that day, and, and I, I got up and announced uh, the church was going to have a business meeting on Thursday night. And uh, Brother Hall looked like he'd seen a ghost, you know. I mean, it was my first month or two to pastor, and, and he was in the service maybe three months. And he was in the service, and I could see him, and he, he's just uh, sitting on the back. And, and I said, we're going to have a business meeting uh, tomorrow night. Uh, this is a Wednesday. I said, Thursday night, we're going to have a business meeting. We need everybody to be there. And uh, he was like, you know, you don't call a business meeting. You just became the pastor, and you don't call a business meeting on a special night. And uh, and I began to uh, emphasize the important that ever the importance for everyone to be here. If you can walk, if you can talk, we need to get everybody out Thursday night, seven o'clock. We're going to have a church business meeting, and uh, and 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 everybody's thinking you done overstepped your lines now. And then I begin to explain we're going to go do the business of the church. And Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. And the greater, greater than voting on the color of carpet is the real business of the church spreading the gospel. Amen. Uh, greater than voting on the budget is the spreading of the gospel. A uh, greater, uh, greater than, than uh, what we do with a lawnmower or what color paint we use, or, or, or what, what we do as far as renovations on a building is the real business 
of the church. And, and though many people would be involved in, in all of those second tier things that the church does, we need more people involved in the most important, the utmost important thing that we are to do as a church, and that is spreading the gospel message. Why are we failing in the Great Commission? Our Lord left us with this business. It's a family business, our Father's business, spreading of the gospel. So how about Hampton Road Baptist Church? Might we be busy? It's a little different day that we live in, but we have some unique opportunities. You know, there's nothing that keeps you from getting a phone book and sending out a letter to people in the community during this time. I mean, I wonder what that would look like. I wonder what would happen. You know, it goes back to doubt. You know, you, you sit down and you ask the Lord, Lord, help guide me to send this to the right people. And the Lord directs you, and, and somebody gets a little card in the mail from so-and-so, Hampton Road Baptist Church, and, hey, uh, we're the church down the road, and uh, I don't know if you have a church home, but we'd sure love for you to join us sometime, listen in, and, and here's the track of our church, here's the gospel message. If you're not saved, I sure hope you get saved. Uh, the Lord loves you, and here's my testimony, whatever. I, I wonder what that would look like if we did something. I mean, there's just, you could go on and on and on with ideas of what how we could be. Certainly there's some things we can't do, but there's still a whole lot of things we can do, and we're to spread the gospel message. I hope we'll be busy doing just that. Some will not, because they don't know what they believe. If that's you, you need to get to studying. There's no excuse to not know what you believe. Get to study. And you, you don't follow me or, or somebody else. Don't just believe something because the pastor said it. You believe it because the book said it. Amen. Uh, because God Almighty said it. This is the absolute authority, not me. Believe it because the Bible says so. So know what you believe. Bad doctrine, then bad doubt. Uh, o ye of little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? Don't doubt the God of heaven. Amen. Uh, hey, don't doubt that God's not working. Doubt, don't doubt. Bad, bad, uh, bad doctrine, uh, bad doubt. Maybe it's bad discipline. You just gotten lazy. Feel like that's eh, for everybody else, not me. That goes back to that apathy. Uh, that apathy that should be us. And so I don't know what the reason is. Maybe it's bad deception. Well, if you're not saved, you can get saved today. The gospel message. You're a sinner, but the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You too can be saved, and when you get saved, that's not the end of it. It's not just about being saved and going to church. It's about spreading the Great Commission, the gospel message. It's fulfilling the Great Commission, spreading the gospel message. So I hope you'll be active in doing so. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for those that have joined us. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and convict us in this matter of being better gospel witnesses for you. Lord, I pray that you would help all of our church and those listening and those around, Lord, to know what they believe and why they believe it. Lord, that they would stand for truth. And Lord, I pray that we would get the message out. Lord, your will is not for us to have uh, truth and sit on it, but rather to take truth and spread it, deliver it to others. Freely we have received. Lord, I pray that we would freely uh, give it out as well. Lord, bless the invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to use an altar, uh, use your seat there and, uh, and that'll be just fine from here until further notice. Thank you.